What's up, everybody? Welcome to what's I was I almost said what's on the shelf Wednesday because <laughs> I just filmed that video. Welcome to uh, Wednesday night uh, here on the Master and Drum, uh, the Master and Drum live stream. We are here. Uh, let's see, regular uh, Master and Drum time. Thanks for joining in. We have a wonderful, wonderful guest coming on tomorrow night. We have Mr. Todd Leopold uh, from Leopold Brothers uh, Distilling, who's going to be coming on. We're going to be talking about basically what you guys saw in the intro, which was. The story of not only the distillery and the amazing things they're doing at Leopold in uh, in Denver, Colorado, but also they've made some headlines uh, recently because of their three chamber rye whiskey, which we have right here, which is one of the most unique unique whiskeys. Well, maybe not so unique, uh, maybe unique to today's drinker, uh, but you know this has a very interesting history, which we'll get into, uh, and. Um, you know, we'll talk with Todd about, you know, just the distilling, some of his background. You guys will get to ask some questions about what the hell a three chamber still is. And we'll all learn a little bit tonight. So it's going to be a really fun, uh, engaging stream. So I want to say hi to a bunch of people in the chat here real quick before we bring on Todd. Uh, B Sims was here early. Uh, Rob Shields, Danny Lynn, Old Man Joe. What is up, guys? Tim Gorgeous, C. Jackson. What's up, guys? Uh, Justin Jenkins, JG is here. Uh, Old Man Joe, thanks for coming in, man. Rob Shield, uh, uh, Roy R. Does Things. Uh, let's see, Anthony Orlando, Mike Mosley's in the house. Kenny Killingsworth, what's up, man? Uh, Brett Marquette has got the drum line going, the drum train. Wade Ward is here. Michelle Martin, nice to see you, Michelle. Uh, let's see, Jeffrey Wax in the house. Super Dram is here. Lito Cortez, all right, here we go. <laughs> Choo, choo, choo. Everyone's getting the train ready. <laughs> uh, Austin Feltz is here. Hey, Black Bourbon family. Raise your drinks up handily. I just probably messed up the words, didn't I? Raise your drinks up casually. There we go. I said handily. <laughs> uh, Ham Turkey is here. Abby Huinks, of course. Thanks for coming in, Abby. The other half of Mash and Journey is here. Hope you guys are, for those of you out there that got to try the look at the birdie, Russell's Reserve pick. Hope you're enjoying it. We got some great uh, feedback on it here. Um, uh, so I, I can't wait for him. I'm glad everyone out there is enjoying it. I'm already halfway down one of my bottles, so it's already sad. <laughs> Steve A is, uh, he's got some bourbon in his glass. Um, fired up for this as Chris Stormer. All right, perfect. So, so real quick guys, Leopold brothers is an independently owned distillery founded by brothers Todd and Scott Leopold. Uh, our guest tonight, Todd Leopold received his diploma in malting and brewing from the Siebel Institute of Technology in Chicago in 1996. So after he graduated, he trained at the Doman school in Munich, focusing on the production of lager beers, pretty cool place to study uh, beers. Uh, doesn't much get better than, than Munich. Um, he has apprenticed at several breweries, distilleries throughout Europe. Uh, him and his brother, Scott, purchased four acres of land in Colorado to build their distillery, which opened in 2014. Now, this is the cool part, including systems to create zero waste facility through recycling water, composting, uh, and a few other methods. Uh, in addition, uh, a larger space to accommodate all their fermenters and stills. The site also became home to Colorado's first and one of the only distillery malting floors and kilns in the country. We'll get into that, um, as well as a Dunwich style barrel house, uh, tasting room, education center, all of it. Uh, but like I said, recently they've gotten some big headlines uh, discovering, you know, you know, in the whiskey world for discovering that emerging modern distilling practices abandoned the more flavorful, but more demanding whiskey creation through a three chambered still uh, and abandon that for the efficiency of column stills. So curiosity and just good old hard work uh, brought back a forgotten style of whiskey along with the help of Vendome. And it's sitting right here on my table. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Todd Leopold to the show. How you doing, Todd? Good. Beautiful day in Denver. Uh, it's always a beautiful day. In Denver. I love Denver, man. 
<laughs> we're, we're, we're very, very lucky. I'm watching the, the Pacific Northwest. I hope anybody that's watching from there has really solid air conditioning. Yeah, it's been it's been crazy hot out there, hasn't it? Yeah, one of our uh, one of our monsters just got back from Seattle, and I think it hit 108 or something like that. Where oh, which is there, it never gets that hot in Seattle. So uh, yeah, <laughs> he was so, happy to come back here. So what is this in a general? I mean, not to get into this too quickly, but in a general, um, you know, I guess a normal day or or normal month or or even a year in Colorado you know, aging barrels, you know, you have a dunnage style warehouse. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what, what do you normally get? And then what is this heat you think doing to the whiskey? Well, for, it, it's actually not very hot here, uh, hot here today. Um, okay. That's good. The, the, the dunnage warehouse, it, it, it's, you know, what you typically see in Scotland and it, it's just, it connotes that you're using earthen floors and the reason that we do that out here is it's so dry and if you yeah. you know think of your barrel as a permeable membrane right the the amount of water that's that's above that barrel uh, affects the evaporation rate so I, i'm sure you've spoken with or, or had uh, distillates from texas and some other places and though oh, yeah for sure. if you if you don't do anything to mitigate it you can get uh, you know, evaporation in the double digits percentage per year, you know, 10, 12, 15%. What we did, um, we uh, put in the Dunnage style warehouse and then encircled the building with really good irrigation and then put some plants in with some dip, drip irrigation on the outside so that it's getting moisture in the vicinity of the, of the building so that it works its way into the interior. And on average, it's between, uh, as a result of this, it's between 20 and 30% more relative humidity inside the warehouse than outside. So we did that to make it so that it was more humid to slow the angel share. And as a result of this and a few other things I'm sure we're going to get into at some point tonight, uh, our evaporation rate is only 4.1% per year, which is what you see in Kentucky. Yeah, um, that's, that's incredible. I, Oh, yeah. Well, I thought it would work well. I'm very surprised that it worked that well. <laughs> um, and it's one of those rare occasions where I got a handshake for my uh, brother um, for, for doing something right. He's a, <laughs> he's a, well, he's a Stanford educated engineer. Oh, okay. Uh, so a, lot, and, a lot to a lot to, uh, a lot to live up to there. It's a yeah, it's a it's a high bar, and it also doesn't help that I'm the younger brother in the in the family, so the compliments don't come out very often. So, well, guess, uh, well, well let's talk about that a bit. So, sure. you, so you and your brother Scott, uh, mm -hmm. when did when did this uh, dream start? When did it become a reality? And well, you know, we, did it always? You know, did you have an idea in mind of what kind of distillery you wanted Leopold Brothers to be, or did it kind of evolve as you went? Did it kind of grow organically? It, it evolved. So yeah. that, that when you said we started in, in 2014, that's our that's our current building. So we yeah. started in 1999. Okay. Um, so you started, started, you started you started in Michigan, right? Started in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and the, as I mentioned, my brother uh, he got his master's from Stanford in environmental engineering. And we start, and you already explained my background in brewing. We started as a brew pub that was designed to be what we would call at the time as close to zero waste was the sustainability wasn't even a word back then. Um, <laughs> what, what happened was my brother was working for fortune 500 com for an engineering company that would go into fortune 500 factories. So like the Crayola plant. Um, and in his mind, he was fresh out of Stanford and wanted to change the world. And, you know, as you do in your 20s, and hopefully that doesn't go away, but um, <laughs> he, he, uh, he wanted to go in and, and show them how to make these uh, factories not pollute, basically minimize, pollute, reduce, reuse, recycle. That wasn't even in terminology. <laughs> okay. but, but what he found out really quickly was all of these large companies just wanted him to get them EPA compliant. Okay. And then get the hell out of my hair, kid. And he didn't want to do that for the rest of his career. So what he decided was, uh, you know, let, let's show people how to make an environmentally sustainable factory. And so that's what we did. And we, so we, I, you know, I went off to brewing school in Chicago and then Germany. And, um, you know, when we had, we had the environmental se uh, sustainability section in our business plan. 
Um, so we're out shopping, you know, trying to get bank loans in 97, 98. And it was so, that portion was so crazy to a banker at the time that we finally had to take it out, um, which sounds crazy now, but we're, you know, <laughs> I'm pointing at my brother. I'm like, he went to Stanford. This isn't some, um, we're not some crazy hippies or something. This is actually, we're using less energy. We're using fewer materials. We're using, you know, these weren't things that anybody was thinking about at the time. You yeah, know, your, for sure. your packaging. So yeah. um, from a sustainability standpoint, think about how much better that bottle of whiskey is versus a six pack of beer. It's yeah. con it's concentrated alcohol. We yeah. need, yeah. we need, you know, there's less in the way of shipping. There's less in the way of gas there. You know, you can go on and on um, about whiskey being or vodka or pick your spirit. Um, you know, the, but these were the things that my brother and I were thinking about at the time. How do you, how do you make it so that you're water efficient? So for example, it doesn't matter whether we're talking beer, wine, or spirits for every bottle of, of whatever it is of, of booze you produce, um, you'll have anywhere between four and as high as 30 bottles of wastewater. Um, our, our plant is a little bit less than three, which is very, very good. Wow. That's amazing. Uh, it's very, very low. And the, you know, the, the water use is particularly out here in Colorado in the West is very, very important that you be as efficient as possible. Um, but in the seventies and eighties, before people thought about it, it was, you know, very common to see breweries with, um, you know, 50, 50 to 60, uh, bottles of wastewater for every bottle of beer produced. They just, nobody thought anything of it. I, I remember talking to some fellow brewers in the, in the nineties who said that they would do a chemical clean on a tank. They'd turn on a three quarter inch pipe to rinse it out and then go take lunch <laughs> because it didn't cost them anything. There was no, and there was no thought towards, yeah. you know, you know, trying to be efficient. So who cares? Yeah. I, I know when I come back, the tank will be properly rinsed. So what difference does it make? And, you know, obviously things have changed, but you know, one quick story when we, um, when we open up our doors, this is Ann Arbor, which is a, you know, very liberal, liberal and very, they, they think that they're very environmentally conscious, I guess is a, is a way to put it. Okay. The, we lost in, uh, for a county award for sustainability to a bottled water company. <laughs> <laughs> so that's but, ironic. <laughs> well, right. But, but again, you know, <clears throat> People, people didn't. Why is that? Why would bottled water be bad? Nobody gave any thought. My brother and I were yeah. looking at each other, exactly. going, Ex "Excuse me, <laughs> do you not under? Never mind." Yeah, do you, you guys, know. do you guys understand what you're drinking <laughs> the water out of? Okay. I, yeah. Right. So, but you know, th things change. So that's that's how we got our start. We started with German style unfiltered lagers and our license was such that we were a manufacturer so we could only sell what we produce. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine how popular unfiltered Schwarz beer and Pilsner and uh, that those sorts of beers were in 1999. The only way that we could, you know, so we did okay. We were all right for the first few years, weren't all that busy we needed to add alcohol because we had this huge place and it was designed for groups of 20 groups of 30. We had big, long German style picnic tables, you know, that you'd see in a beer hall. Absolutely. And, and when you do that and you have large groups in 1999, easily half of them didn't really like beer. And so the, <laughs> and so the only way to get around it was to start distilling. So we pulled the distilling license. Um, I went back over to uh, Austria and Germany to train um, cause I still had some lovely connections from the brewing world, uh, to make O to V. So Kirsch, Foster, pear brandy, apple brandy, that sort of thing. And then came back, uh, to Ann Arbor and fired up the still. And we made, we're one of the first, if not the first, uh, distillery pubs in the country. So we made the vodka, the gin, the triple sec, the coffee liqueur. That's how we got our start. So we started distilling in 2001. Um, and then we, uh, we, we moved to, to Colorado to cut to the chase in 2008 and built the current building that we're in, in, in 2014. But, um, yeah, we were, we were distilling by what, uh, Lance, Lance Winter and some of the older distillers have been around for as long as we have. This is our 21st year in business, I guess now, uh, the dark wow. ages where there weren't any cocktail bars. There weren't, you know, the show Mad Men hadn't come out. 
Uh, um, well, I, you know, listen, that's really where everything changed. Well, yeah, that, absolutely. That show came out. There was that, yeah, right around that time is when stuff maybe you people know, we started. Still, what what's Don Draper drinking? Yeah, yeah, we were we were still waiting for that shift to happen. You know, that's when. It, so for the first decade, our biggest customers were in San Francisco and London. Believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Because there was, those were the only two places that had any kind of serious cocktail pro programs back then and understood what it was we were trying to do. Then Mad Men came out and then all of a sudden we were in the right place at the right time. And our, yeah. our sales, you know, explo explode. Yep. And yeah. we, we built a new building that we're in. We added the floor malting. So the, both the brewing programs that I had taught malting and uh, the Chicago, the Siebel Institute, uh, half of the course was in malting. And uh, so well, as, you're, as, you're, as you're talking about Malton, I'm going to throw a couple pictures up here from the oh, story please. because um, I don't know if people, I mean, when you think of Malton, you know, malt, like good old school. So I, I don't know if you guys watching have heard of the, uh, you guys have heard of the, the you know, the, the whiskey uh, monkey shoulder. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's the, the ailment that guys that were constantly, you know, turning the grains on these malting floors and the, you know, in the old Scotch distilleries were, were getting. So I would imagine on paper, that doesn't seem like a very smart business practice to do <laughs> floor malting, especially because everyone is just sourcing their grain. Yeah. But um, I, like, you, like you said, you guys kind of have a, uh, an extremely definitive goal into making everything you know, as authentic as possible. Um, here are some pictures, guys, of the, of the floor grains. There's, there's Todd <laughs> digging up, turning some malt there. Um, so... We're talking about laying some malt down on a floor, uh, you know, in a cool, dry place, some yeah. humidity there. And then there's, there's, you're holding some, some malt there that's beginning to sprout. Yep. Which is the, that's the time when you want to stop the, stop the, uh, the, the process. And that's when you're going to start actually uh, malting this stuff. That's when you're going to start killing it. Kill, so, uh, killing so, it. I'm sorry. Yeah, killing it. No, it's okay. So yeah. the so that's our old malt floor. Oh my god, I haven't seen that picture in a while. <laughs> so that that's pro, that is about five thousand pounds, and we yeah. expanded over the over the. Uh, Boy, I haven't done that in a while. <laughs> um, the the uh, we we had a very large expansion, and we're now putting twenty thousand pounds on the floor. And and the 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 crew just unloaded the steep tank uh, just a few a uh, few hours ago, as a matter of fact. And it's uh, a lot more. It's it's twenty thousand, and the and the old man isn't up in the on the floors like he was back in the. Um, back in the day, but you can see yeah. where you would get that monkey shoulder. So what that, yeah. what I was doing with that shield, that's called, it's called a shield. Um, and it's, it's turning the malt over as you throw it through the air, you're in a cooled room. That's at about 55 degrees and with throwing it through the air, what that does is it makes it so those rootlets that you saw don't grow together into a big carpet, which is really bad. Cause then you can't move it at all. Mm -hmm. It's the last thing that you want, but it also releases heat and it cools it down. And so what, you know, in Scotland, they would call that turning the piece. Yes, it's very unusual. We're the only distillery in, in the world that I'm aware of besides Springbank in Scotland mm -hmm. um, that makes 100% of the malt that, that we need. And we do it because it's fun. <laughs> it's so much fun. We take so much pride, obviously. Yeah. It's an awful lot of hard work. Um, I mean, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Springbank. Are distillers like mm -hmm. that kind of big influences for you? Oh, very much so. Actually, they, they were kind enough to let me go make an ass out of myself uh, <laughs> a, a, a few a few years back on their malting floors. But yeah, very much, very much. It, it's a question of your. We're trying to make something that that that's unique, yeah. um, and making malt is so fun, and we get to make the exact flavors and aromas that we're looking for. And you know, why not take advantage of it? And a lot of the reason, or or I should say. We would not be doing this in Colorado if it wasn't for Coors. And many people don't know that Coors have been making their own malt for decades. So as a result, we have farmers that are used to making to world-class farming practices. So I can, for example, for the three chamber rye, mm -hmm. uh, show up and, and uh, say, okay, this is the nitrogen content I need. By the way, this is an heirloom strain that hasn't been uh, hasn't been grown in a hundred years, and I need you to make sure that it it comes to harvest. No problem. 
you know, <laughs> so it, it's because they're used to working with cores and the tolerances that they have and the, the sustainability uh, programs that they have at cores, you know, helping the farmers use less water, you know, not use as much of the way of pesticides and other things like that. And plus mm -hmm. in Colorado, a lot of people don't understand grain really isn't designed to, to kind of grow everywhere. It doesn't do very well in more humid environments simply because um, you, when you're dealing with moisture and grain, there's all kinds of mycotoxins that you have to worry about and disease is more of an issue. Here in Colorado, it's so dry all the time. It's really just perfect for, for growing, whether we're talking about barley or wheat or, or rye. It's much easier for the farmers to, to handle it. And uh, they just grow world-class grain for us. And so our job basically is not to screw up the work that the farmers did. Yeah, I, I think what's an interesting mindset uh, from from you guys is the fact is the the absence of malt in today's mash bills. You know, mm -hmm. the the amount of malt that's not there. So generally, mm -hmm. so I mean, everybody in the chat, generally when you look at a bourbon mash bill, you're looking at, you know, 78, you know, 10, 12, and, you know, maybe five or six if you're lucky. Um, we're seeing some distilleries get up there with some some malt content. Uh, the, the first one that comes to mind is is Old Elk. Um, you know, Greg Metz is, you know, putting, you know, 30, 40 percent barley in in, um, in his uh, bourbons that he's crafting there. Um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, sometimes barley and bourbon sometimes gets a bad rap. Like, OK, yeah, they use it for the enzymes to help convert starch to sugar. And there's that aspect of it. But it can do wonderful things to a mash bill if you're doing it right and you're treating it with respect like you guys, which I think is what you're doing. Um, tell us about, you know, some of the, you know, I, I guess because of the malting floor and how you want to use your malt and, uh, and, and, and also in future spirits that you're working on now. Well, the, the, the thing that a lot of people forget when you're, when you're looking at distilleries back before Prohibition, Mm -hmm. So many of them were, were, were relatively small. So a lot of them uh, were just using brewer's malts. And when the difference between a brewer's malt and a distiller's malt, distiller's malt is what all the, the larger producers are using. And the, it, is, it is malted in such a way to maximize the enzyme content of that malt. Mm -hmm. And so without making this a 30 minute long discussion <laughs> after the, after the germination portion, you use really, really cool temperatures for a very long time because heat will denature the enzymes that you grew on the malting floor. So a lot of people don't know the entire purpose behind malting, like the 100% purpose behind it is to synthesize enzymes. So an easy way to explain it is think popcorn, Mm -hmm. The flinty end is the embryo. It's a seed, corn. It's the same thing in barley. It's the same thing in rye. You got the flinty end where the embryo is. And then the, the starchy part that turns into the white fluff of the popcorn, that's the food reserve for the embryo, right? Until it can eventually, it's a seed, until it can get its nourishment from the earth. So the malting process is you're getting the moisture content. You're steeping it in cool water. The cool water tells the enzyme, oh, I'm in the earth. I need to start growing rootlets. So what does the enzyme do? The enzyme can't eat the white, starchy, fluffy part, right? Mm -hmm. so just like yeast. It's a very strange Darwinian quirk. <laughs> so, so what does the yeast have to do? It takes proteins and turns them into enzymes. And those enzymes will break down the starches and turn them into rootlets eventually and turn it into a plant eventually, right? It's a, it's a life raft is an easy yeah. way to look at a seed. Yeah. So the, the flooring process is where you're allowing that process to occur, where you're synthesizing the enzymes and it's consuming some of the starches and other compounds. You don't want to let it completely go because if you do, there's no starch left for the, pro the brewing process or, or the distilling process. It, it'll turn into a plant. So the way that you started the process to get it germinating was to add water. So how do you stop the process? You take the water out and that's where the kilning process. That's when you kiln it. Yep. Right. So those seeds that you saw with the rootlets growing out will be, you know, 40, 44% moisture. You'll put it into a kiln. So you got a perforated deck here. Yep. There you go. So mm -hmm. that's about 44% moisture. And you're going to put it on a stainless steel deck that has a lot that has a, a space underneath it called a plenum. And you'll grow warm air up through that malt and the malt will be piled on it 
anywhere depending on the kiln, one to all the way up to six feet depending on the whether it's a modern kiln or an old school kiln. And that warm air that you run through it, um, when you're making distiller's malt, the, the warmest temperature you're gonna wanna use is maybe 140 degrees. So it, it takes 48 hours. It, it's a very, very gentle air and you're not doing anything really to create any flavor. So as a result, distiller's malt tastes like raw barley essentially. Yeah, That's what most of the larger distillers are, are using. It's what we use. Mm -hmm. um, for, for some of the other things, we make vodka and some other things. What a brewer would use is they'd use warmer temperatures because uh, as they're running these warmer temperatures through, remember that that's still alive. The enzymes are still active in that, in that uh, what's called green malt at that point, at that 45% moisture. Okay. It's dropping down to maybe 20% moisture. If you're trying to make like what's called a pale malt, which you use in an IPA or something like that, mm -hmm. hit it with temperatures that are maybe 160, 170. What that's gonna do is create some sugars in there. And then at the end, at the kiln off, which is after about 24 hours, you're in what's called the curing phase. You can use temperatures all the way up to 190 degrees. And when you've created some sugars in, in, that, uh, in that green malt and then you hit it with 190 degree heat, you have what are called Maillard reactions. And what that does is gives you cracker flavors and, and baked bread or think uh, the crust of pizza, baked goods, that sort of flavors appears in the malt. And that's going to pass through into your, into your whiskey. What I was getting at when I said before that people forget that before Prohibition, we had a lot of smaller distillers. Mm -hmm. Most of them didn't have access to distiller's malt. So what did they do? They'd call the brewer or the miller down the road, take some brewer's malt and add it into the mash. The problem is, is that because you use that higher kilning temperature of 190 degrees, you're denaturing enzymes. So distiller's malt, as it re relates to uh, regular brewer's malt, it'll have maybe half the enzyme load. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. So as a result, you have to move that, that recipe up to adding 20% malt to it. And when you're adding 20% malt and you're adding malt that has been kilned to a higher temperature, what's that going to do to the whiskey? It's going to completely change the profile of it, and you're going to get entirely different flavors. And what... The, whiskey fans are starting to understand that not everything has to be made the same way that they're making whiskey in Kentucky and there's other ways to do it. And I want to make sure that I'm perfectly clear with you and your fans. <laughs> I love Kentucky whiskey. I love yeah. the, the, you know, the, these distillers are absolutely my hero heroes. I'm just explaining there are different ways to make whiskey and there's, oh, there's, yeah. nothing, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. And, and my viewers would tell you in the chat, I mean, I talk about, I talk, I talk about terroir. I talk about, you know, the way that, you know, other whiskeys are made across the country all the time. Can, you know, the, I always say that the, uh, the, um, the, what you mean, the limestone shelf does not end and die in Kentucky. <laughs> you know, it goes well, on. There's there's good there's good water across the country. There's people using doing you know doing the right grains. You're you're a huge uh, example of that. Yeah. Um. So um. So that. So that's a good transition because you're talking about how they made whiskey back then using the different types of malts. Uh. You know, in comparison to today. Um. Tell us about this, the, the, the beginnings of the journey of this. You, when, I, when, I, when I watched the video, tell us about the 14th floor readings. <laughs> <laughs> so the 14th floor readings is something that I used to, I used to post about. So I'm, um, if you haven't figured out, a, a, a nerd. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I really enjoy reading about the old processes. And, and as a brewer... Um, you, you have access to the Master Brewers Association archives, what goes back a full hundred years. The mm -hmm. Siebel Library had documents. They were founded in 1872. So there's all these beautiful old documents. I went to brewing school with uh, Gary Stroh the fourth, Stroh's beer, you know, uh, uh, up in Detroit. There's all yep. of this, you know, knowledge and, and old documents from those days. And to me, it's just fascinating, you know, the the before you know some of the smaller brewers showed up in the 80s and 90s we're kind of moving to homogenized you know processes for a lot of you know in a lot of ways for the for the brewers and i just got fascinated in the old production methods and and uh you know going over to to, to uh, learn in germany was just eye-opening because i came right before 
the the beer consumption in the in the 70s 80s and 90s in germany were th was through the roof mm -hmm. i got there got to school in 1996 right before the consumption per capita was plummeting because there was nowhere for it to go really I mean, it, <laughs> yeah. it was just a ridiculous amount of beer that they were consuming yeah so i was seeing the very last very older ways of of making beer were, were open fermenters were being uh, changed out literally while i was in there changing to the conical fermenters that you see everywhere and when you when you ferment open um, you, you literally have what are called yeast skimmers where you're harvesting the yeast off of the top of that fermenter to repitch into, into future batches. That whole art and method of fermentation was disappearing right before my eyes. So for me, learning about these old things just absolutely fascinated me. And at the time, I, I, social media came up. I lived in downtown Denver with my wife and, and we were up on the 14th floor and I would send out what it was I was, you know, reading about some obscure malting technique from the 1800s. <laughs> and the reason that I did that was my, my nephews were in school and I was a bit worried that they were looking at what it was we were doing. And it just looks like a big party and, and trying <laughs> to show them how much work goes into it. And it's, a yeah. you know, that I'm a professional and you keep up on readings and you read current MBA technical quarterlies that came out and, you know, make sure you're, you're up to date, even though I'm a distiller now and not a brewer, it still has things on fermentation and oh, absolutely. bacteria and all these things. Yeah, that they, are, go, they go, they definitely go hand in hand. Yeah. And I mean, I, I mean, what, what I thought was crazy is, you know, when I kind of heard about the 14 floor readings, then, you know, we had the bottle and bond act that happened mm -hmm. and then you came across the, it was the Cramden and Tolman papers, mm -hmm. which was, now this was crazy. So, they commissioned the IRS, yeah. the Internal Revenue Service, to go out to distillers to create, I guess, the blueprint for how people are making whiskey, what they're making, how they're making it, the processes, to try to come up with a, you know, uh, as we know, Bottle and Bond was, you know, it was mm -hmm. the, the first, you know, the first law, you know, consumable law that we had, you know, in the United States. So it, mm -hmm. was, it was groundbreaking. So after this, Let's let's get the IRS to see if we could come up with a uh, a standard plan with how to craft this stuff, and then tell us about like how that went in your studying. Well, part part of the 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 stuff that I left out that historian David Wondrich uh, uh, helped fill me in. Mm -hmm. The head of uh, the head of the IRS at the time was the first whiskey nerd. So the head of the IRS, you know told about his travels when he would go to Ireland, he would go and, and to Scotland, he would go distillery hopping. He was a whiskey nerd. Mm -hmm. and it, it was just a complete coincidence. And he hated all the counterfeit whiskey production that was happening at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the bottom and bond came out as I, as I mentioned, but the study that he commissioned uh, that the scientists Crampton and Tolman to do it was a survey of 31 different distilleries. About half of them made rye, half of them made bourbon, and they did a complete breakdown of the production process. So um, what was the grist recipe? How much corn? How much rye? How much barley? Again, most of them were using 20% malted barley. That was very common. What was the entry proof? Um, and by the way, every single one of those distillers was in at 100 proof or just a hair higher. 100 proof was the American standard before prohibition. It moved up. Um, and the reason it moved up was to save money. So in 1962, um, distillers were on the ropes. They had just done their patriotic duty yep. and, and created uh, uh, alcohol for the war effort. And, uh, and then they did the same thing again for, for the Korean War, started getting prep, uh, prep for that. The bottom fell out of their whiskey market and the last of the, the Pennsylvania uh, and Baltimore rye distillers closed. <laughs> And they petitioned the, the TTB, the, the distillers that were left, to allow them to put the whiskey in at a higher proof. And the reason for that, obviously, if you're putting whiskey in it at, at 50% and all of, you move it up to 62 and a half, you can fit more whiskey into fewer barrels and fewer rickhouses. It saves money. Oh, uh, yeah. The, the yeah. issue with that is it changes all the chemical reactions, of course. But the most important thing to understand, the easiest thing to understand is that um, when you're in at 50%, the proof may go up a few points. But... When it comes time to bottle, you're you're not adding a whole lot of water to that whiskey to get it to to get it down to proof. If you're starting at 62 percent and it's moving up into the 60, I'm sure your fans have seen cast strength into the high 60s. Yeah, 
what happens when you drop that down to the 45 percent that just that's so common right yeah i mean the, the flavor the flavor just dies normally you're washing all the fla all the flavors yeah. out but anyways within that paper with those 31 distilleries again i said half made rye every single one of the rye producers used a chamber still except mm -hmm. for one and like your so many of your viewers i wondered what the hell is a three chamber still i didn't <laughs> i had no idea and then I started chasing after it. And so I, I finally found some more documents that um, that actually showed it. I had, you know, had a look at it as I'm staring at it and, and pouring <laughs> over it over the years. I'm realizing, oh, OK, I understand why this does what it does. And the description they had for three chamber rye, first of all, it was marketed as heavy bodied whiskey. OK. And, and the still is really designed. It, it operates at higher temperatures and higher pressures. And the result of that is it pulls more of the oils out of the rye and the barley. Okay? Yeah, yeah. So what that's going to do is that oiliness is going to make it. So when you have a nice big sip of it, it's going to coat your entire mouth and it's going to make that finish last for forever for one. Um, and the other that those, the higher pressure and the higher temperature is going to pull out more aromatics and flavors than you're going to get out of a column still or a pot still. Column still in a pot still, for the most part, the temperature, operating temperature is usually around 198 degrees. There's a whole lot of it. It depends that I can throw into that. But generally speaking, that's roughly where you are. The three chamber still operates in such a way that that bottom chamber is north of 220 degrees. That higher temperature, again, is going to extract those oils. It's going to extract those flavors. And when I understood that, after I understood how what I thought the still would do, I came across a, a document that described what, what was then the largest distillery in the world. It was in Peoria, Illinois. Okay. Uh, it was commissioned by Hiram Walker. So this was 1910. They made 100,000 gallons of whiskey a day, um, which I just blows me away. <laughs> like, what the hell? And I just can't yeah. even picture... So, and so it, is this is this where you saw the flow chart? And that's where I saw the flow okay. chart that that okay. showed the different stills. Mm -hmm. uh, you know how the flow worked. You know it was gen. It's not engineering drawings. It's still an artist rendition. But what it showed was two column stills and a three chamber still. It, it obviously when you're this that large of a production plant, a continuous still is operating 24 hours a day. So I'll do my little pantomime he here. Um, here's, <laughs> here's your here's your column still, right? Uh -huh. you, you're going to pump, they're usually a couple stories tall. You're going to pump the mash into the top of the still or close to the top, you know, at seven, eight, nine percent alcohol, whatever the heck the plant's using. The, the mash is going to come in and the still is designed so that the mash cascades down like a set of stairs down to the bottom and then they inject live steam from the bottom that's going to strip the alcohol and flavors out of that mash on the way to a condenser the mash is going to exit the bottom of the still as animal feed all the alcohol has been stripped off yep but many people don't know that the design parameter for a column still from entry to exit is 90 seconds oh, so wow. you, you so you've got 90 seconds to get all the flavors that you're looking for out, out of that still. That's a short window. <laughs> That's a very short window. And again, to be perfectly clear, you can make absolutely beautiful whiskey in a column still. I just want to make sure I get that out there. Yes, yeah, but you're, I could see your, your, your mindset here. You're looking, okay, this huge distillery is making 100,000 100, gallons of whiskey. Mm -hmm. um, you have two continuous stills. What, what, why do you have this little, th wouldn't you just build another continuous still? That's exactly it. And why, why, do you, why do you have this, what is this little three chamber thing doing over here? That was my uh, aha <laughs> moment that I you know, sat down with my brother and showed it to him and said, there is absolutely no way that a company that big is going to put in a three chamber still unless the distillate is going to taste so different that the, not a, there weren't whiskey nerds back, well, not many anyway. Um, <laughs> there, there, there's always nerds throughout history, right? But, yeah, yeah. Um, but there's no way that they would go to that expense unless the whiskey was so different that the average person could tell the difference. And yeah. once I got that, I begged Scott to allow us to uh, go to Vendome and, and have them put the still together for us. And of course, Vendome does builds all the stills for, for all of the, the larger distillers, uh, you know, in Kentucky and Tennessee and everywhere else. And so I figured if anybody 
um, knew how to do it. It was them. I, we, we were already longtime customers. We've ar already bought several pot stills and a, and a vodka column and some other things from them. So, so when you went to Vendome and you approached them with this, what did they have an idea of a three chamber still or did they no. literally have to? So, all right. So they had no experience at all in building. They had, stuff. they had none. They, they went and looked in their archives and they had also purchased another uh, still manufacturer so they had a bunch of old drawings. I think they built, bu purchased the other one in the sixties or something like that. And I forget the name of it. Okay. They came, they came up with absolutely nothing. And so I, I worked with a, a gentleman by the name of Gordon Lung, one of their junior engineers. And we were working on it for a few weeks. <clears throat> and then we got a, I got, I got a call from the Shermans who, who owned Vendome. And I've told this story many times, but um, <laughs> he, 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 he called me up to, you know, boy, this is certainly something interesting you're doing. And he, yes, sir, it, it is. And he said, well, Todd, you know, I just have to tell you, I can't, I can't guarantee that this still is going to work like our pots and our columns because I, I don't understand what the hell it is. Uh, <laughs> and I said, don't worry about it. Your engineers, you know, have it taken care of. The metallurgy was the biggest part, uh, making sure that it was safe <clears throat> and that it had reinforcements in the proper places because, you know, with that column still that I mentioned, you know, your mash is only on each one of those plates, you know, a few centimeters high yeah. and a three chamber still it's, you know, four feet deep, a, a, a chamber. So there's a lot more mash, a lot more vibration, a lot more stress, higher pressures, all of that stuff. And they did, they did a wonderful job. And I knew, I knew what it was I wanted it to do and where it is that, <coughs> excuse me, I wanted to put the pipe work. And, um, you know, even though there were a lot of, of, uh, uh, drawings or descriptions that explain that the, the three chamber stills had doublers. Yeah. Uh, I knew that the writers were incorrect, that they're not doublers, that they're actually thumpers, which is an entirely different, has an entirely different effect on the whiskey. Um, so we put a, th uh, a thumper in instead. And uh, yeah, it, 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 it came out just beautifully. And the, the, you know, of course, you, the first thing you do with equipment like this is you run a water brew. You run water through it, um, you know, just to make sure everything's, you know, sealed and safe and all that kind of stuff. And if you make a mistake, it's water. Who cares? And then uh, <laughs> uh, on a Saturday about five years ago, we, we ran it the very first time. And, you know, of course, I had to tell my brother what the distillate was going to be like long before he cut a check. And it was exactly what I thought. It just it, it's, it, it smelled and tasted like I'd put lavender in the condenser. It was so aromatic, so floral. And I'm sure your fans have seen a, a spirit safe before. It's basically a, there's a hydrometer cup in it and the, the distillate, you know, fills the hydrometer cup so you can put the uh, spindle in that tells you what the proof is and the alcohol flows on the outside of that glass cylinder. Well, at the top of the glass cylinder, normally it's completely flat across the top because of course alcohol is very low surface tension. So when mm -hmm. you have alcohol in it, normally it's pretty flat. Well, with the three chamber still, it throws a meniscus, even at 70% alcohol, that's going to go up about two centimeters. It's pulling so much oil out. And that very first day was a very happy day. And <laughs> uh, from there it was, okay, let's get this into a number four char barrel. And uh, now I have to wait. And the, the part that I, you know, will readily admit I didn't know, I didn't know how long it was going to take, uh, you know, maturation wise. Um, I knew it was going to be two years. That's the first thing. Of course, my brother, when he's cutting this enormous check, wants to know is when, when are we going to have whiskey ready? <laughs> and the one thing I knew is that there's no way that two years was going to be anywhere close to enough. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. it was after the very last summer that we had that the esters really came and, and matched up with the rest of the savory notes that I was mentioning, the lavender and the, the floral notes, the tea notes, the, yeah. Um, spicy notes as well. So, I mean, so you, I mean, you even went as far as, and I'm going to pour a little bit of the rye because we're going to try this shortly. By all um, means. Uh, so I, I dropped a link in the chat guys for a, uh, for a YouTube video where it's a video of Todd actually going through exactly how the three chamber rye uh, system works. Um, how it starts at the top, it kind of works its way down and keeps going. And at each point, it's getting oilier, it's getting more flavorful, and you're getting some more of those uh, those flavors and esters that you were talking about. It's mm -hmm. a fascinating uh, video. 
Uh, I put it in the chat. It's a oh, thank YouTube you. link. So you guys can go check that out. If you want to learn more, get really take a deep dive into how it works. Um, but aside from just the still, okay, then you're like, all right, we got this thing we paid millions of dollars for. Now, uh, how do we, all right, what, what are we going to make here? What, what, what are we making? So in, in your research, pretty much every distillery back pre-prohibition was making a rye whiskey. Mm -hmm. um, but they weren't getting the rye that, you know, most people are getting their rye today from. Uh, they had Rosen rye and then, you know, and then they had a bruzy rye, which is mm -hmm. from my homeland in Italy. So uh, <laughs> uh, talk, uh, talk a little bit of why you chose to use a bruzy rye. And, um, and so you guys are using a combination here of 80% uh, of bruzy rye and that 20%, you know, your, your tried and true floor malt. Right. Uh, so, kind of go, go through the reasons for that. And then once we do that, let's uh, we'll get into the to the whiskey a little bit. So the 20 percent floor malt going back to that Crampton and Tolman paper, that was um, pretty much the common recipe uh, among the rye producers. They were doing 80, 20. That, that was the most common thing that we that I saw. We use 20 percent in everything that we make, whether we, it's a bourbon or our Maryland style rye, which is a whole uh, another kettle of fish that we'll get into some other day. Um, <laughs> yeah, Maryland style. That's another. That's yes. a whole other ball of wax. <laughs> but it's uh, yeah. A lot of people don't know, but we're you know, that was us that that released the first Maryland style rye um, yeah. since Prohibition. Um, everybody thinks it's odd because it's Colorado, but when we released it, there weren't any distilleries making whiskey in Maryland. So you know. Anyway. Uh, so that 20%, I was, I was fairly well, well set on. I, I like what that brings to a whiskey. I like mm -hmm. that it's a, a little bit different than, as you mentioned, the, the, uh, the folks that are doing three, five, seven, ten percent 10%. I just like that, that flavor. A bruisey rye, uh, you know, came from, uh, you know, again, more of those studies where, you know, when, when I'm reading these old textbooks from the 1800s in Scotland, there's a very uh, large tome um, from a gentleman by the name of Shackleton, which was a complete survey of Scotch distilleries. I'm sure you can find it on Amazon these days. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, basically a phone book, but it goes through the expectations uh, in some of the sections on the starch content of barley back in those days, and it was usually in the 60s. These days, right now, with the most modern strain of barley, you'll see starch content um, north of 80%, as high as 84 is what I've seen these days. So... What you have to understand is the difference between 60% starch and 80% starch. When you're weighing out a, a mash as a brewer or distiller and you've got a target uh, uh, alcohol concentration, there are formulas that you have where you, you understand that starch is the same thing as sugar because you're going to convert it in the mash ton with the enzymes. Mm -hmm. And if you've got something that, that is at 60% starch versus 80% starch, you're weighing out how many pounds of starch you're looking for to get, say, a 5% alcohol mash. Yeah. You have to add, of the 62% starch, which is what the Abruzzi rye is at, I have to add 30% more of it. Why? <laughs> because it doesn't have that much starch in it and or sugar. So if I want 5% uh, alcohol, I have to add more of this. So understand what that means. We have literally been breeding the flavor out of our grains for the last 120 years, basically, where yeah. we're looking for more and more starch. And the problem with that more and more starch is starch doesn't have any flavor at all. Yeah. So yeah. having more starch is great if you want to make more alcohol. But if you're trying to make something that has more flavor, this is counterproductive. So... For us, when we're looking at these older varieties of grains, I'm trying to find samples from seed banks. And with the Abruzzi rye, it came back at 62%. So first of all, I'm like, okay, that's, that's what I want to see, that very low yield, because now I know I have to add more of it. The rye is going to have more flavor. It's mm -hmm. going to have more oil. And if it's 62% starch instead of 82%, what does that mean? That means that you got that 20% of gap. What is there? <laughs> and, and, and in the case of the Abruzzi rye, it's more compounds like uh, linalool, linalool, linalool um, smells and tastes like lavender or elderflowers. It's where the floral notes come in mm -hmm. when, when you're talking about a bourbon that has rye in it or, or yeah. when you're talking about a rye whiskey. And it has another chemical compound in it called ferulic acid. And, and we're already nerding out, so we may as well go the whole way, right? So yeah, keep uh, going, man. 
So for <laughs> what ferulic acid, so I made hefeweizen, German style hefeweizen for uh, 15 years. You are taught in, in uh, German brewing school that the way that you control the amount of that clove flavor, that four vinyl glycol is the chemical uh, compound. The okay. way that you, that you adjust the level, the balance between the clove and the banana is by how much ferulic acid you get in the mash. Ferulic acid is found in, uh, it's found in wheat, it's found in rye, and most barley varieties don't have it. I'll get back to that oh. later. Interesting. But the way, but the way that you control it is two ways. One, you can find varieties of wheat or rye that have have more of it, and you can also uh, change your mashing procedure to break it up. And so there's free ferulic acid and there's bound ferulic acid. It's, so, yeah. so is that is that kind of the reason why you see like distilleries like Barton and even Old Forester get that banana note? Is that is, is, the is banana? That no, that's a that's isoamyl acetate, and that's a different conversation. Okay. Um, right. That banana that banana note that you're getting from it uh, comes from the strains, the yeast strains that they use. All right, so that's more yeast. Okay, there you go. Guys. Absolutely. Because oh, we get get asked all the time, "Where's that banana note come from?" There you go, guys. It's the yeast strain. It is absolutely <laughs> the yeast strain. You get it in Jim Beam. Yep. Um, the, yep. the two the two big things that you get that in Kentucky whiskeys with the yeast strains that they choose is isoamyl acetate, which is banana. Mm -hmm. And if you're not getting the banana, what's the other? Oh, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't need to do that. Um, the other one is isobutyl acetate, which is raspberries, raspberries and stone fruit. So mm -hmm. think Buffalo Trace and the other ones where all of their whiskeys have that big. Some people call it stone fruit. Some It's isobutyl acetate. And that's the yeast strain that they choose and the fact that they ferment very warm and they're trying to get that a lot. They're stressing that yeast strain that they chose out. And when you stress yeast out, it gives off esters. So they're intentionally stressing the yeast out to try and get those big um, either yeah. banana flavors or those, get big those, raspberry big, flavors. Yeah, those big bold flavors. Okay. Right. So anyway, so back to the ferulic acid. The other component that you need with the ferulic acid is what's called a POF positive yeast. And what that means is phenolic off flavor, um, which is short for, it means a hefeweizen yeast strain, okay? Okay. So if I'm making a lager beer, I'm going to use a POF negative yeast. If I'm making a Hellas or a pale ale, I don't want that spiciness, I don't want that clove. I'm going to use a POF negative yeast. What a lot of people in the distilling world don't understand is all the major yeast strains that are used in America, Red Star is the big one that's dry, a dry yeast that most distillers use. And then in uh, Scotland, they're using M or the MX strain. Those are, are POF positive yeasts. What are they missing in Scotland? The ferulic acid. So they're using a hefeweizen yeast, but mm -hmm. they're not feeding it compounds to get that spiciness. And a lot of people get confused and think that the spiciness is because you're just adding, the rye is inherently spicy. The rye is not inherently spicy. What you need is that ferulic acid in combination with a POF positive yeast, which is most of the yeast strains. Long story short, uh, the Abruzzi rye has elevated amounts of that. And so and, and not only that, but also oils as well. Correct? Oh, very much. So most, most rye varieties are somewhere between 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and, and really as high as 3%. Uh, oil in it, and the Abruzzi rye had elevated amounts. And as I mentioned, um, the the three chambers still is a rot, is an oil extraction machine. So I wanted to make sure that I emphasize that. So no, I mean that's I'm, why I'm gonna, we chose the yeah, Abruzzi. I'm, I'm going to have to go back and watch this another hundred times to kind of get all that like uh, <laughs> you know back in my head. But this is this is like amazing information. It's it's very. I mean, I'm fascinated by it. I know you know the audience is too. So thank you so much for all the nerdiness. This is awesome. Of course, of course. Um, Some people who give me a hard time say it's like drinking for a fire from a fire hose, but everybody, everybody can understand all of these things just fine. And I, and I think uh, the, the people that are fascinated in whiskey and we get tours all the time. They're, they're people who come to visit us. They're engineers or they love to show how it's made. <laughs> right. And, and, have, yeah. and it, it's a, it's a situation where, where we have curious minds and see, I love, see, I love that. I love that show too. And I think, you know, I think that's a big part of why I get so into the, the making and the craftsmanship of it. Um, but you know, it, you know, and not to, not to like call out, you know, people that get into whiskey and, you know, all they know and all they want to see is like Pappy and, and I get that lore of it, but I just feel like, you know, folks that are getting into whiskey and that's all they know or 
because you know there's a there's a place in uh, Kentucky, uh, Justin's House of Bourbon, who I'm sure you know, mm -hmm. and um, you know great guys, and like one of the greatest like just museums of whiskey that you know you could see in there. Um, and they just have so many incredible whiskeys there that, you know, that the old uh, Red Hook Rye, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> which is just, uh, I mean, to see that in person is amazing. And then, you know, I'm looking at that bottle and then 75% of the store are looking at, oh, look at the puppy. Oh, I'm like, <laughs> guys, I'm like, you have to like look around and see what's what's behind you and learn about, you know, why this stuff is so rare and it's not all about this. You have to just broaden your minds a little bit, please. <laughs> well, but I think that it's the reason there, there are so many great shows like yours and Minnick and Bourbon Vault. And there are places that you can go now. So understand how this looks from my perspective. Yeah. None of this existed for the first half of my career. Well, yeah. Any, that's any, true, yeah. Anybody remotely interested in this thing is, is a wonderful place. Yes, and if people yes. start with Pappy, it's a beautiful whiskey. Who's gonna so, argue? Who's gonna argue? Yeah, that? I'm not. I'm not but arguing. It's not. No, I know you're not. You know, I know you you're know not. not. You know, I I'm absolutely saying. do. But yeah. the people that are curious, you know, the the, the way that I've uh, I've explained it is, is, over the years is the stills and you know the stills and the mash bills and all of these things. It's the honey that's attracting all of the people, and yeah. in the end, in the end, it's about hanging out with, with, you know, with your friends, celebrating occasions or, or just celebrating the end of, you know, the end of a day, whatever the hell it is. And, and yeah. And, and all, and all I can do is, is provide, you know, be a conduit for, you know, uh, between the people that are curious and getting into it and learning about it and then leading them to people like you and others that are doing so many different things in the whiskey world today so well beyond what we thought was going to, was, was going to come of all this. Um, I just, uh, yeah, I, I think it's great. So, well, there, there's, there are so many wonderful distillers out there that are, mm -hmm. that are doing great things. It's such a segmented market. So understand part of the reason people don't necessarily know who we, who we are, you know, even we, we've been at this for two decades. Um, we're a little bit better known currently for our liqueurs. We make an absinthe. We, we make uh, several wonderful gins that we sell around the world. Yeah, I mean, you make gins, you make, uh, you guys are making brandies too, correct? You make uh, a little bit of everything. A little bit of everything. Yeah. But think about how the liquor store is set up. Yeah. These different tribes don't mingle, right? When, <laughs> it's, when, it's very when, true. Whereas with beer, if you like beer, it's all in one yeah, section. It may spot. be organized by local beer yeah. and international beer or whatever. But if you're going in to get your bottle of Leopold's gin, you have no idea that we made a three chamber ride because <laughs> you go in and get your gin and you get out of Dodge, right? So it's a, it's yeah, a, and, and liquor I, is a different animal than yeah. Beer. And I think as people get more familiar with you know craft distilling, not that you're, I think you're well beyond craft now. I don't really think there's anything such as a craft distiller. Just everybody makes things differently and uses. I love hearing that. Yeah. I do not like the word because more yeah. than anything, it's an insult to the people at, at Wild Turkey and Buffalo Trace and Beam and all of those places making wonderful yeah, wh exactly. whiskeys. And if what they're doing isn't craft, I don't know what the hell it is I, I, anyone thinks we're doing. I, 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 I totally agree with you. It's uh, it's it's not a, there's no such thing as craft distilleries anymore. Everyone's using yeah. what they have to offer. They're just doing things differently. And, and all of you guys push each other's envelopes and which is the great thing. So oh, we've had several of the larger, you know, the larger distillers have come out to, you know, to see us. And, and um, it, it's a it's a smaller community than, than I think some people realize. And, and yeah, you know, it, it's yeah, I, it's I, nice to be another another bloke on the rope pulling. Yeah, I've, I've, said that. I, I've tried to, you know, tell that to people, too. Like, you know, you, you think some of these big heritage distillers, they're all kind of against each other. These guys have been doing it for no. years and years and years, and they. They talk and they and they share ideas and they help each other and that's what it's a, that's what it's about. They made whiskey when whiskey wasn't cool. Yep. Um, they they did everything they could to keep the, keep the lights on to you know to they were making rye one day a year. That's a pretty well known story. At, yeah. At, yeah. At Wild Turkey, um, and, and you know it, this style of rye almost completely disappeared, and certainly the three chamber um uh dis disappeared completely and and part of it as i mentioned was because of world war ii so with the chamber still uh you can't make 
high proof spirits. You can't make 95% alcohol in a chamber still. So what happened in World War II? The War Department shows up at your distillery and says, guess what? You're putting in a column if you don't have one already. And of course, every distiller is going to say, absolutely, we're going to mm -hmm. do what we need to do to win the war. And so um, I, the answer I like to give when people say, you know, why did the three chambers still disappear? I like to say patriotism. I think that's kind, <laughs> kind, kind of a fun. Well, that's one of the, you know, dozens and dozens of those stills got pulled out and never went back in for obvious, re you know, it costs money to put these things yeah, back it, in. It costs, it costs too much money. It takes longer, obviously. It takes and much it, longer it's and much it's longer very and inefficient. It's and it's a much and, uh, lower yield. It's a much lower yield. I mean, why are we going to keep this thing? Let's get, get this place filled right. with column stills. Let's go, guys. Uh, and Rob and Shields. Is, sorry, Rob. Rob says, Todd, please tell me you're going to Bastards Ball this year. Thanks for uh, feeding us the moods. <laughs> that that uh, I'm assuming that's the the event in Austin. Are we thinking yes, about yeah, the same thing? Yeah, uh, the they Austin. were they were they were kind enough to invite me, and I'll be down there with with Mrs. Leopold with bells on. So we're we're they were very nice to let us uh, let awesome. us into in, into their party, and that should be from from what I can tell. Those guys are those guys are great. I really like uh, w they they find the fine line between you know, in, informational and then also <laughs> taking the piss out of it, which I yeah, really appreciate, exactly. but you know, it's a fine line. You, you want to enjoy this without sucking all the fun. It's whiskey, <laughs> you know, <laughs> let, let's, let's, let's not beat this to death. It's important that I understand how all of these different processes work. And I think it's lovely that, that people are, are curious and that's a wonderful way. And as long as they, you know, just enjoy it. And, uh, you know, I, I think that the whiskey, the whiskey vault guys are, I don't know. They just seem like a hoot. Yeah. We, I was lucky enough to go uh, two years ago. Uh, and you know, they're Daniel and Rex, uh, are, you know, they're great guys and they're even, they're even nicer in person. I mean, obviously they have, you get some really a great persona. value, but in that persona, but when you meet them one-on-one, -on -one, they're just, they're great down earth guy that just cares, mm -hmm more than anything about the community and, you know, and what they're doing. So that is what, you know, that is what the note I sent to them, what they're yep. doing with the Texas whiskey scene. It's so cool. And the, the pride that they show in, in what's being made down there. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a, you know, you saw the same thing in beer. It wasn't just one brewery, right? It, it's yeah. all of these breweries together. And I'm, we're all very much in, in a, raising the tide. Right. And, and, you know, I, I said years ago when people would say there's more, you know, distillers coming, coming on, does that bother you? And I said, absolutely not. We know that we're going to be in good shape when you go to a Colorado liquor store and there's a Colorado section. Yeah. And, exactly. and if you, and if you're doing your job and you're making beautiful spirits, you will do just fine in, in, yeah. in that. And you'll, that you'll be on, you'll be on that shelf right next to ours. So absolutely. So, all right, so let's try this. So here we go, guys. Leopold <laughs> Brothers, three-chamber rye, 80% 80, uh, 80 Abruzzi rye, 20% Leopold Flormont, distilled in the three-chamber still. Uh, entry proof. I don't think we mentioned this. Entry no. proof of 100. Yep. So, again, this on, that's the lowest in the, in the biz, isn't it? It is, and it has been for years. We we started doing that an awful. <laughs> oh, nice job! You actually got it focused. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, a hundred proof was the American standard. That's what they did, um, and you know, so we've been we've been doing it for the word go. And the really fascinating thing about our Dunnage warehouse is, uh, the the proof doesn't change. So what you are drinking is unfiltered cask strength. And it's bottled in bond, so we're looking at a four-year-old rye whiskey here it's, as well. That's four and a half years old. Yep. Four and a half. Yep. So I tried this last night for the first time after watching the you know the short documentary um, on on YouTube, and the thing that most stuck out to me is how floral you were saying. And the first thing that punched me in the face was lavender, hands mm -hmm. down. Yeah. I mean lavender. I get a ton of honey on this. Yeah, honey is very honey. common. Yep. Yeah, a lot. I mean, it's like honey nut Cheerios all day long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the uh, the lavender is there. There is a nice little hint of spice. I think you get. There's kind of like this, uh, like this. I think the toast from the rye, from the uh, from that abruzzi rye too, like honey and toast is really nice. There's also uh, it, it's. Um, so something different I'm getting now that I didn't get yesterday was more of a dark fruit characteristic. 
Yep. I think is really interesting. There's a little bit more of a, uh, like a dark berry note going on. I, I've heard dark. I've had. I've heard blackberry. I've heard a lot of people say blueberry. Uh, I, I've I've gotten a lot of people that are saying peaches. Um, at, at some point in in the next few uh, weeks, we're going to send it out and get get a full uh, profile of all the esters. I get all of those things. Uh, that there, it is. It, it is. There, there's a lot. There's a lot going on in this it, class. It's it, all. It's all over the place. Yep. Yeah, it, it is not uh, a one or two note, note whiskey. Um, that, that, that is for certain. And, but this is what I'm talking about. This still is designed to pull aromas out and mm -hmm. the, the aromas are, are the top notes are much more delicate it, in a way that I like to describe this. It, it, and I think your fans are, are interested enough that they'll go have a look, look up lavender oil distillation on YouTube. <laughs> and, what you, and what you will see, it, it, it's a cop, a copper pot still, just like you'd see you know, really anywhere else. And what they do is they pack the flowers, completely pack the interior of the still with lavender all the way up to the top. They take the head of the still and they put it on and connect it to a condenser. And what they use um, is steam. They, they pump live steam and that steam, again, at an elevated temperature and waters the carrier is going to pull the lavender oil and those aromas out and uh, it'll condense and come out the other side. This is going to give un an unbelievably fragrant oil. The problem with this method is it oxidizes relatively quickly. So those beautiful top notes in lavender oil or rose oil, I'm sure some of your fans have come across this stuff, neroli, which is orange oil. Mm -hmm. It's very, very um, unbelievably aromatic, but it's unstable. So the three chamber still acts, that bottom chamber acts like it's, a, a la it's an o lavender oil still. The still above the uh, chamber above it is acting like half alcohol and half of a lavender still. Okay. And then the, that top chamber is acting like an alcohol still. And because the ch the steam enters from the bottom, it's taking all these three distinctively different distillates and different styles of distilling and putting it together in one stream and condensing it. So as a result, you're getting notes. If you uh, have a chance to splash some water in that, and I wouldn't advise doing it now, leave the room for 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. If you come back, it, it's going to, uh, you're going to be able to smell it in the entire room because those top notes are in there and they're stabilized by the alcohol. If that it's, makes it's, sense. Uh, it, it also doubles as an air freshener, folks. That's right. right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so. it, it's really interesting on the front of the pal. And when, when we talk about, you know, when you were talking about the oiliness and, and the oil that it's basically the three chambers still also acts as an oil extractor mm -hmm. and, and how, how it works. This is hands down and I'm not bullshitting anyone, right? This is the oiliest whiskey I've ever had. Yeah. I mean, this thing literally just, it just sits on your tongue and it, I mean, I, I don't know if the camera will be able to pick this up. Oh, it gets a nice meniscus. We'll see. If, see the drips there on the side? They're not moving. Yeah. I mean, they're barely moving right there on the top there. I mean, they are barely dripping down. It is so oily and so rich. And I'm t I mean, this thing evolves. I mean, as you know, I'm starting to get the peach now. I think I understand what people are saying with the peach. But I'm getting all like spice, cinnamon, and now chocolate on the back end too. Yeah, there's a lot of chocolate in it. Yeah, yeah that's the abruzzi rye as well, cocoa nibs, whatever. Um, you can understand, you know, why we put the still in. You you can understand why the distillers prefer why the the Hiram Walker plant insisted on having one together with those two uh, those two columns because it makes yeah. a different whiskey. Uh, and uh, it, it's very, uh, I think uh, David Wondrich called it rambunctious. Um, <laughs> I, I, I really like that, that uh, I really like that terminology, but you can see what you were drinking was the dominant rye whiskey all the way up till prohibition. If you ordered an American rye, that is what was gonna show up in front of you. Yeah, and, it, and it's been, it, you know, we've, you've had some historians say this is probably the closest thing we've ever tasted to a true pre-prohibition rye well, spirit. Well, the, the easiest one, uh, you know, the old Overholt is the one that people point to. An old Overholt, not, not the current label, but the, the older one, 
<clears throat> as far as we can tell, we can't tell definitively that they had a three chamber still. Um, but um, ba based upon, you know, tasting it and so they, it was kind of a, you know, deductive reasoning where if you were using pot stills back in those days, you almost always advertised that, that it was copper pot distilled. Mm -hmm. The fact that they did not do that kind of lets you know, but um, Old Overholt w was owned by Mellon of Carnegie Mellon. Everybody knows Carnegie Mellon University. And they had an auction of, of a cachet that they found in one of his mansions. He, so he owned the distillery for a bit. <clears throat> he was a U.S. treasurer during Prohibition. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine whose distillery stayed open doing, during uh, Prohibition. <laughs> you know, what a, <laughs> what a coincidence, right? <laughs> but um, David Wondrich and, and Tony Sachs and some of the other spirits writers that are out there got a hold of some of that cachet from 1910 and did side by sides. And they were just, um, Tony Sachs said, thank you. Now I don't have to blow $3,000 to get a, <laughs> to get a pre 200 milliliter buy. sample. Of, <laughs> you know, now I can buy it off of the shelves. The, the one thing I want to clarify is we weren't trying to match old Overholt or match those old whiskeys. We were trying to make a different whiskey that we knew would be delicious. That's what was important. We weren't trying to be old timey. We weren't trying to replicate it. We're not yeah. doing, you know, some of the people, you know, think like, well, should it, you know, should they use a boy? I don't know that, that we <laughs> should be trying to copy, you know, what you could have back in the 1800s to make the, that's not our goal. Our, our goal was to make the most delicious whiskey possible. And it doesn't surprise me that it tastes like, you know, those older whiskeys, because of course we're using the same tools, the still, um, we're using the, the grains that were available back then. And we're using a mash bill that was very common then. So it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me that that, that that happened, but that was certainly a very fun day. Um, when David Wondritz, uh, he, I sent him out a sample several months ago and he tweeted out this tastes just like pre-prohibition <laughs> rye whiskey. Unfortunately for your viewers, that has made it, made it. So this is a very difficult bottle to find, but we're trying to make more as best we so, can. Uh, so, so, I mean, how many bottles did this, you know, so when you did your first run, put in a barrel, how many barrels did this fill? You know, what, what was your, what was your yield that you wanted to try to create for this? Two, two barrels a day. Okay two barrels a day. So it's not a small amount. Um, the very first release that we do, you, you have that on your, um, uh, on your border here. We did 5,280 bottles and it was the, you, I thought it was something worth celebrating. The first three chamber rye whiskey in over five decades is, is something that should be commemorated. So um, yeah. I hand signed every one of those 5,280 bottles. And of course that sounded a lot better in the meeting than it did in uh, rea re re <laughs> reality, but of course I kept telling the crew we've hand numbered our, our batches from day one and it used to always be me because, uh, you know, it was myself and one other guy, uh, running the plant for the first 10 years. So, but anyway, <laughs> um, but after the five, you know, after this first, uh, uh, round goes out, we'll come out with our, um, our, our full release and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how it does. Uh, so some a quick some quick questions here in the chat before I let you go. Um, um, the so from Donald Rance, he's up in Canada. Mm -hmm. I've never considered using Brissetto rye. A lot of rye producers here in Canada have had a lot of success using it, making killer ryes. Is it a desired profile thing? It it, it it's a little bit of everything. It, it and it depends on who you're talking to. Um, it, some of it is yield. Some of it they want to make sure it's disease free. Mm -hmm. So a, a lot of distillers aren't buying the rye uh, or, or wheat, for example, uh, from a commercial warehouse. They're buying it direct from a farmer. And mm -hmm. if you're buying direct from a farmer, that better be disease free. Um, you better not have any of, you know, any of those issues. So that's part of it. For the most part, you know, understand going back to what I'm saying, if it's a modern variety, it's, it's about two things for the grower, you know, yield in, in the field. So in other words, how many pounds of this rye do you get per acre? And then on the distilling side, they've been pushing up more and more of that starch. So most of the modern varieties for me and for what I'm trying to do is, it isn't something I'm interested in. That said, you can absolutely make beautiful ryes with the, the uh, beautiful Canadian rye, uh, of course. I mean, that's what they're known for, obviously. Yeah, you, yeah. you can make world-class whiskey with, with that rye variety. 
we're just choosing something different. That's all. Um, so not only this question, but this was a question I had. Are you making rum using the three chamber still, or Good what? God, do you have? No. Do you have? Do you have any? Do you have any plans to make any other types of spirits, or, uh, you just, or is this this strictly for the rye? What do you? What's kind of the future plans for the three chamber? We've been making an awful lot of uh, of rye whiskey in it. We've yeah. we've put uh, uh, malt in malted whiskey in. Of course, we make our own malt, so it seems kind of silly not to run it through the chamber. Still. Oh yeah, hell yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, there's there's absolutely no chance in hell I will ever put molasses into the three chamber still. And let me tell you, <laughs> let, let let me explain why. Um, so we've made rum before. We made it when we were up in Michigan. Uh, molasses, in case you didn't know, is the it, it, and I'm trying to explain the chemical part of it. It's the garbage <laughs> left over from sugar. So understand what that means. When you take that molasses and you put it in a still, it has all kinds of crazy salts and gunk. And if I run that rum through that three chamber still, I'm not gonna do it because I'm too old, but one of the crew is gonna have to go in there and scrub the living hell out of the still to get all of the gunk that comes out of uh, a molasses. So either, you ha in, in my opinion, you have to use a dedicated still uh, to, to make, to put molasses into it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for, for rum, you know, we made a rum that was very well received and, and there's a, a re really well-known tiki bar uh, called Smuggler's Cove. And Martin Kate is the gentleman who owns that place. And he loved the ride that I made all those years ago in Michigan. And he's like, every time I talk to him, he was, he was like, Todd, when are you going to make, when are you going to make that rum again? And I'm like, well, uh, Martin, I made two barrels of it. How many <laughs> bottles do you have of it? And he said, I, well, I still have three. And I'm like, Martin, I made that over a decade ago. <laughs> <laughs> so does that kind of explain the problem? Yeah, guys, here? Yeah, like, I think that explains where the, the rum is on your order of doing, of <laughs> distilling things right now. <laughs> we are the, the rum distillers in the Caribbean are they're They're cane farmers. Mm -hmm. You cannot compete with them. They can make a world-class rum, absolutely beautiful world-class rum mm -hmm. on the shelf for 20 bucks. Like I cannot do that. So uh, you know, tell, tell us a little bit about your, uh, your bourbon. Um, that's, I mean, your bourbon is something I, I haven't tried, but what's the, what are you guys using as, as essentially in your mash for your bourbon? And can you tell us for those of us outside of Colorado, where we could find your products? <laughs> that's, that's a tougher, tougher conversation. <laughs> I think. Is that a tougher question? Um, well, for the, for the whiskeys in particular, I think yeah. it, it, it is a little bit. So, so the bourbon, so the, the, a few of the things that we do do different with the bourbon, and I didn't really touch on this because it gets people confused uh, in terms of the three chamber. We ferment very, very cold. Okay. Um, so I kind of touched on this a little bit, that the, the general way to make the American whiskey method to make American bourbons and rye, generally speaking, is they'd like to make a higher alcohol mash. Mm-hmm. So these days that means somewhere between eight and 12. And I've even heard 14% alcohol. Um, the older way of doing things is at a much lower alcohol concentration, which is what we do, which is what Springbank does. Springbank does six and a half percent. We make ours at 5.5%. The reason I do that, there's a, a Bavarian brewing adage that I learned over in, in Germany. Um, and it's uh, that for young brewers that your customers should not be able to tell how strong your beer is until they try and get up from the table. Okay. And so, yeah, everybody it always gets a chuckle. So what they mean is use colder temperatures. Don't try and give them a whole lot to eat. Make sure there's plenty of nitrogen. Make sure there's plenty of zinc. It's a nice, happy fermentation. Instead of making it ferment for seven days, allow a nice lower fermentation for 30 days. And if you do that, it doesn't stress out the yeast. If you don't stress out the yeast, you don't create esters. And the biggest ester of all is ethyl acetate. Mm -hmm. So bourbon and whiskey fans will know that as uh, uh, heat or booziness or hot or whatever descriptor they want to use. The reason that so many American whiskeys taste like this, and Charles Cowdery, the whiskey historian, is really great with this. He always says, if somebody says it's smooth, I know that they're not talking about bourbon. He's correct because for the most part, they like to make a higher alcohol thing. So in other words, 
if you're making a five alcohol, 5% alcohol, 5 alcohol mash or a 10% alcohol, think about how much more sugar that yeast needs to consume. So the 5% alcohol is a nice, light, healthy salad. To make 10% alcohol, you're saying you're holding a gun to the yeast head and saying, okay, you need to eat two Thanksgiving dinners and you got five minutes to do it. <laughs> okay. what, it what does it do when that ye the yeast gets stressed out? It creates esters, but in America, that's intentional. So that mm -hmm. banana note that you mentioned, yeah. that's because they're fermenting warm and they're fermenting to a higher alcohol. The yeast does not like that. So what does it do? It stresses it out and it gives off that ethyl, ethyl acetate, but it also gives off the esters that they're after. Yep. So I'm not saying this is a bad thing. I'm saying this is a different way of doing things. What we do is we ferment much, much colder and we go after our esters in a different way. So we do a 72 hour fermentation, just like everybody else. All the sugars are consumed. There's no sugars left. We let that mash sit for another 48 hours. What happens in that 48 hours, if people did not know, when you are adding the, the malted barley together with um, rye or corn in the case of bourbon, the temperature that you're holding at is really around 144 degrees. That is not hot enough to kill bacteria and malt is rife with lactobacillus. It, it's got bacteria all over it. It's living on it. It's part of what makes malt malt. It's part of the deal. Yeah. So after the yeast is consumed, if you just let it sit and the uh, lactobacillus is no longer competing with yeast for food, the yeast has stopped fermenting and is flocculating to the bottom of that fermenter. Now the lactobacillus can start to go to work and consume the compounds that the yeast can't. So things like dextrins or lignocellulose, things like that are floating in that mash. And the lactic acid bacteria consumes it. It gives off lactic acid and it gives off acetic acid. And there's a very simple process that occurs inside of a whiskey barrel. So you've got your whiskey barrel, you've got alcohol in it. It needs to have alcohol for this to happen. And you've got organic acids floating in that solution. Over time, oxygen works its way into the barrel, combines with those organic acids to create esters. So that's why as you're, if you're tasting whiskeys, um, you know, your, your fans have tasted one, this, the same mash bill from the same distillery that's four years old versus eight. Generally, the eight-year-old one has a lot more of that fruit in it. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's esterifying in the barrel. So the other producers are trying to get their esterification by fermenting really hot in the fermenter. We're trying to get those esters that you're getting in the barrel. So it's a totally different process. It's why that, the, uh, that whiskey at 50% is really, really soft. Um, the one gas chromatograph that we did run, um, the fusel alcohols and ethyl acetate that you get in that three chamber rye is half of what you see in a typical, uh, typical rye whiskey. And that's because we're fermenting in the 60s instead of the 80s or 90s. We're not creating those compounds. The last part in, in terms of you know, that heat and that Charles Cowdery comment is with the continuous still, there aren't any cuts. Mm -hmm. So you, you got two exit points. I'm generalizing. There's some other things and thumpers and, and, yeah, and I, doublers I, I and all. Yeah, I see without, what you're saying, though. Without getting into that, for the most part, your input and output, your stillage is coming out the bottom of the still. Um, you, you're, you're looking to um, – uh, you, you're not having any real cuts the way that you would in Scotland or Ireland using a pot still. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. So in, in, you know, in a simple terms, you're kind of – uh, embracing the bacteria a little bit. Very more, much so. Our more fermenters than, more than trying to avoid it. Uh, absolutely embracing the bacteria. And our fermenters are actually situated um, to my left here next to windows that lead out into the garden. And we designed our building so that we can open up the louver, open those uh, windows in the morning when it's nice enough out. And it's designed to pull air out of the garden across the fermenters and, uh, and up at the top. We are trying to encourage, but you can't let it spiral out of control. Yeah. You know, it, it, there's a bit of an art to it and a bit of experience that, that's in it because if it goes in the wrong direction, that same lactobacillus can create a compound called acrolene, um, which in, for vodka producers, they call it the peppers if it ever gets into their still. Mm -hmm. and, and what they mean by peppers is pepper spray. Acrolene is the active ingredient in some old school pepper spray. So if you get that into your still, think about what picture taking a, a bunch of pepper spray and boiling it in a pot still you're going to be evacuating the distillery if you yeah, get I don't that wanna, your, yeah nobody wants to drink that nobody <laughs> wants to drink that and you certainly don't want to be anywhere near a still when you're boiling pepper spray so yeah um so that begs the question though uh okay floor malting mm -hmm. uh you're 
you're kind of you're you're a little bit you know you, you've been uh what do you call it uh <laughs> you know you, you've had that experience at Springbank. What's mm -hmm. the what what when are we seeing something peated from Leopold with the floor malting? What's happening? Well, we now have a we now have a second uh, a, a second <laughs> kiln, so we got a, a larger second kiln. You know the problem again uh, if you're kilning, um, once you get smoke into that kiln, <laughs> everything that you produce out of it is going to taste smoky, which I'm sure some people are like. So that sounds awesome, but. Um, we, we, we use our malt for a lot of things and we sell to a lot of, uh, brewers around the country. Um, we're with a very large, uh, wholesaler as a matter of fact. Uh, <laughs> so we can't introduce, uh, Pete into our, in, into what it is we're doing now, but we decommissioned our smaller, uh, still. And at some point we, we will recommission it, make a, a smaller amount of peat, uh, peated malt and put that into the chamber still. That's awesome. Uh, all right, really important. <laughs> Julie Light coming in with a fifty dollars super chat. Oh my god, thank you, Julie. She says, "Todd, hi, Julie. What, what causes the effervescent like experience that could come along with certain rides, like Thomas H. Handy, for example?" This was recently a big debate. Uh, this is something that I've had to deal with because we were the one of the first absent producers in America. Um, that that you know, people swear that it gives them a different kind of of uh, buzz. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've always re responded with that. When I was younger, gin would make me kind of dancey. <laughs> um, <laughs> dancey, dancey. Kind, Todd, kind of dancey. And I'm sure you Dancey Leopold. <laughs> yeah, it was. It, this was in my uh, 20s. Um, <laughs> of course, I didn't have rhythm then either. But anyway, um, and I'm sure you've heard the, the, um, the, the, uh, what am I trying to say? The, the saying about tequila or mezcal that there's a fight in every bottle. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, I'm sure, sure you guys have heard that. It's it's to me it's really very very simple. These are very complex chemical compounds that you're consuming, and it's not just ethanol. The the ethanol is the euphoria portion of the program, but your body is going to react differently to you know it's a, it's a simple thing. If I have a couple glasses of wine, I am going to feel different than I am with a couple glasses of gin or a couple glasses of whiskey or beer, you know, wine puts me to sleep. You know, you, your body reacts differently. It's more complex. And I'm not sure I have yet to come across a study that will tell you that. But to me, that's the intuitive answer that I can give you is, you know, the chemical compounds are different that you're getting. So you heard me talking about, uh, um, you know, the ferulic acid, and, and that's going to give you a lot of uh, a compound called uh, uh, four vinyl guaiacol, that spicy note. So if you really want to go uh, off the rails with your experimentation, uh, one night have a, some of the handy, and a couple nights later, get a six pack of German Hefeweizen. Maybe you'll find out that it's a four vinyl guaiacol that, that's giving you <laughs> that feeling. Um, <laughs> but it, it, if you haven't figured out I'm not a doctor, <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's the portion of my education that I'm missing. But to me, it just seems common sense that, you know, these liquids aren't just pure ethanol. Mm -hmm. Not even vodka is pure ethanol. There's still other compounds. Yeah, there's other that, compounds. In and there. your body's going to react differently to it. Bubble Bat Bourbon asks, keep samples of the yeast plus lacto for each batch for future usage, or are they all going to be wild? The lactobacillus is always spontaneous. Um, the, the majority of that lactobacillus, as I mentioned, is coming in with the malt. The wooden fermenters that we use, is uh, we, we, there's no real way to sanitize them. Some people steam them. Some of the larger producers steam them. Mm -hmm. That's still not going to kill everything. It might reduce the population. But our fermenters, when we, uh, when we clean them out to put them back up, they're, they're physically clean. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to look horrifying or anything. But... Obviously, you're still going to have bacteria living in the pores of the wood, which is why producers like to use that. Um, no, we don't reuse it because uh, it, it's an open top fermenter and we're, we're milling the grain in. So if you look at the top of the fermenter, so I mentioned before we made, uh, I made beer in Germany with an open top fermenter. Um, with beer, you're separating the solids from the liquid, you're adding hops and you're boiling it. It's a liquid. There's no solids in it. So when, when we're talking uh, uh, about, you know, pulling the, the yeast off of it, in the case of the Hefeweizen fermentation, the, the yeast will populate at the top as it's fermenting and you can just use a, a stainless steel 
looks like a big butter knife and literally pull that yeast off and use it for the next batch. As, as a distiller, having the milled rye, hammer milled rye with all the grain in, it's mixed in together with that yeast at the top. And, and you could, it's usually a couple inches thick mixed in with the grain. There's yeah. no real simple way to repitch that. I hope that answered the question. Wow. I mean, let's see here if there was any other questions. Uh, yeah, people are going to start using the word dancy. They kind of like it. <laughs> oh, God, um, no. please, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Julie was getting at that feeling um, uh, where sometimes whiskeys give you like that, almost like you're drinking a carbonated beverage on the top. Oh, oh. I yeah. I have to be honest. I've never heard that descriptor before. Yeah. Uh, I've never heard somebody explain it that way. Yeah. Well, there's uh, there's certain. Yeah. It's almost like a like a or you or you get some like almost like a pop rocks feeling, you know, on your tongue a little bit. And it's it's hard to try to figure out like man where the hell is that coming from it's it's either you know well I don't really I, I really can't give you an answer I mean the oil content of corn if it's not obvious is substantially higher than rye yeah and, and I'm trying to think what it is that could coat your tongue that could give you that sensation mm -hmm. I, I I I'm at a bit of a loss here I apologize I don't have an answer <laughs> for that all right Julie the 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 mystery continues sorry sweetie sorry about that. <laughs> Cameron says, question for Todd, using heirloom malt, how does the diastatic power differ to newer maltings? The, uh, the, the heirloom, bar the heirloom bar barleys that you have, um, the, um, the diastatic power that you have is owing to the, the, the building block to make enzymes are proteins. So if you can find, and you could absolutely find in the 1800s, malt with, with protein, uh, you know, north of 14%. If you're making a brewer's malt, um, a pale malt, a Pilsner malt to make a beer. Generally speaking, and it's 100% malt, I want to make sure I clarify that. Yeah. You're, you're usually looking around 10 or 11% for, for, for the barley. When you're, you, there is no distinction between being able to get access to that higher protein in the 1800s versus today. The, the issue with, that I was getting at is the brewers had the stuff with the lower diastatic power on hand because they were making beer with it. So if you didn't have a maltster that was making that higher diastatic power malt, that's what I was getting at, that it was much more common. I'll just use the malt from down the road. This is much easier than having to go yeah. to a much larger malt house that's making um, distiller's malt that has that higher di diastatic power. So there's really no difference. So in other words, I could find the, the range of protein in the 1800s in barley, and in the 2021s, where you'll see a range of 10 all the way up to 15% protein. So it's not something that was lost. It was just a question of access, you know, whether or not, you know, if you were making whiskey, you know, in Illinois or, you know, a smaller shop like that, uh, you know, in, in the 1800s or Indiana or, or even Colorado, where, you know, where are you going to get that distiller's malt? Whereas brewer's malts would be much, much easier to get. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think, uh, yeah, everyone's pal's different. Um, I think uh, tonight, uh, in my opinion, has been probably one of, if not the most informative that we've had. I really want to thank you, Todd, for taking a deep dive with us into not only, you know, what you're doing at Leopold Brothers, um, not only what you're doing, you know, just in making uh, your whiskeys and how you're making it and the science behind it, but, you know, sharing this incredible bottle with me um, I can't thank you enough. I don't know if I'd ever been able to get a chance to taste this and I'm glad I did. Cause it, it really is, um, one of, if not the most unique thing I've tried uh, just in terms of experience flavors, um, the way it kind of goes from floral to fruity and chocolatey at the same time and how <laughs> oily it is. Uh, I will, uh, if I ever have a chance to get a bottle of that stuff, I'm, and, and if any of you guys watching, have a chance to get one uh it's it's absolutely worth the money mm. um and the time because it is something special and extremely unique that you're not going to find on any shelf anywhere so um todd i want to thank you for coming on tonight and my uh, pleasure thank you very much for having me and thank you for all the great questions they're really good questions and i'm yeah. sorry i couldn't answer one i i feel bad <laughs> it's okay we'll, we'll just keep exploring that one it's uh mm -hmm. it's one of those things but yeah i'm, I'm absolutely uh super excited and 
hopefully when I get out to Denver, Colorado next time, uh, you, you, you guys might be my first stop. Well, we, we are certainly here, and there's a, a lot of very wonderful distilleries in, in Colorado to visit besides us, so don't forget about them. And thanks to everybody for taking the time to watch tonight. All right, guys. Well, uh, thanks for hanging out tonight watching uh, this episode of The Mash and Drum here on uh, Wednesday night with uh, Todd Leopold. Uh, and what can I say, Todd? Thanks again. As I always say, it's not about the whiskey. It's the people you share it with. Amen. So uh, cheers to you. Cheers to the chat. We'll see you guys uh, next week right here on The Mass and Drum. Take care, everybody. Right on. Cheers.